This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello there and welcome to episode 78 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today it's all about border crossings around the world and in particular border crossings in Europe, Africa and Asia because I have some truly cracker stories from some from some great guests today who've had some really interesting experiences crossing borders. Uh, quite funny in retrospect but I suspect at the time they were not exactly laughing. Uh, now I think I've been lucky. I haven't ever had a really tense border crossing uh, just a couple that were memorable for, for smaller reasons, I guess. Uh, one that I remember was traveling. We I'd been in Russia with my mum and she and I had been in Moscow and St. Petersburg for a week or so. And to leave Russia, we were traveling by bus from St. Petersburg over the border to Estonia. So to Narva, in fact, um, right in the eastern corner of uh, Estonia. I'd been that way before on my first trip to Russia and um, loved Estonia. In fact, I think we crossed the border at Narva and went on to Tallinn for a few days. Anyway, so we're in the bus and we get off at the border crossing. And my mum, one of the reasons that we'd gone to Russia at all was because she had for many years learned Russian. And she had been fantastic, um, fantastically useful during our trip there because she could speak lots of Russian. Now, certainly at the beginning of our trip, she was a bit nervous about speaking it. It took her, you know, a good week to really get into um, feeling, you know, more confident about speaking it. But then we crossed the border and on our bus, I'm fairly positive that every single other passenger was either Russian or Estonian. We were the only um, non-locals, so to speak. And so I said to mum, I've been through this border crossing before. They search a lot for um, people who are smuggling stuff. Um, so, you know, we have to really act like real tourists and then I don't think they'll search us because it had been annoying the time I'd been there before. So we get off the bus, we're crossing over the border, etc., etc. And what does my mum do? <laughs> she keeps talking to people in Russian. I'm like, mum, stop speaking Russian. They might think you're a local. <laughs> and she's like, oh, 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 but it becomes second nature to her by then. We'd been there just too long and it, this uh, Russian gene had kicked in. And I always just remember trying to elbow her and say, don't worry. And I probably... Um, looked even more obvious by saying that. But in any case, it must have worked because uh, they searched everybody else and didn't search our bags and that made it, you know, one step more pleasant. Uh, and before I recorded this episode, I asked my son if he remembered anything about crossing borders and he immediately said, yes, Malaysia to Singapore. It took eight hours. And it wasn't eight hours, but it was a good three plus, probably close to four hours uh, on our recent trip there, we were coming back by bus from Johor Bahru in Malaysia over the border into Singapore. And it is a really, it was a Sunday afternoon slash evening. And perhaps that's a really peak time anyway. Um, but yeah, through the Malaysian side of the border wasn't too bad. But then our bus was in a, a massive bus traffic jam. And then standing in um, the immigration queue in getting into Singapore. So for Singapore immigration did take over two hours. And I have to say he was the most patient seven-year-old I've ever seen. He did confess to me today when we talked about it. He said, oh, it was so bored. I was like, yeah, I was so bored too. I understand, buddy. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's a border crossing we don't want to repeat in a hurry either. However, both of those were fairly harmless incidents compared to uh, some of the issues that uh, my guests today have had. Um, now, the first one is, um, well, I wouldn't say it was life-threatening, but it was certainly um, confusing and funny in retrospect. And it's from Elizabeth and Jeff Newcamp. And they are living in the Netherlands at the moment uh, and have had some driving trips around Europe. We don't encounter too many border, border crossings. crossings. If we fly to the UK... We have a border crossing, but mm -hmm. there are a couple of countries here where there are unique uh, requirements to, to cross a border. And one of them happened to us as we were leaving Croatia and headed to Slovenia. Uh -huh. and we noted, I noticed a multi-hour delay <laughs> oh, at dear. the border crossing. You know, when Google Maps goes red or black, <laughs> Bad uh, you sign. think about it. <laughs> so I reprogrammed us to an alternate border crossing. And boy, did we drive out of the way to get to, to this other border crossing. It was off the highway, <laughs> through a couple of small towns, and we got to the border crossing. And Well, all the signs are not in English. 
that was the um, first and, and there's warning, no there's no weight but there's just the eu symbol everywhere and and we do Ooh. have um resident id cards here uh-huh, like we're okay. that could help. The Netherlands, so, but we are we are u.s passport holders <laughs> got it yes and so we pulled up <laughs> and handed over everything we had to someone who didn't <laughs> and, speak any english and they go inside and there's like a big conversation and oh, then no. this everybody comes out of the booth everybody <laughs> oh no that's a very bad yeah. sign <laughs> yeah. and that's the day we learned that certain border crossings are only for you only c- yeah certain types of citizens and it doesn't wow. matter if you have a a uh, resident id card in fact that makes them think that you're like trying to do something oh, no. <laughs> so, you know i think if they just rolled up with our passports they would have been like oh okay you're in the wrong place yeah but we had these cards and this lady's like telling us we should have known better didn't you see the signs and we're thinking like well no (laughs) signs aren't in english we didn't know any better Uh, so we had to drive all the way back and sit in that traffic anyway it was it was the type of place where they hold on to your passports to make sure you don't gun through the checkpoint like they they made us turn all the way around and then they gave them back to us you know on the way out oh gosh um but the good news is we had lost so much time in the charade <laughs> that by the time we got to the legitimate border crossing, we were straight through. Yeah, there was no line anymore. The queue had gone. So, it was like, it didn't matter whether we had waited there. It took us the same amount of time no matter yeah, what. The three-hour drive that took five. <laughs> Oh dear. Yes, I think that part of the world is particularly true, or that part of Europe is particularly tricky. I had a um, where were we? we're we trying to cross into Bosnia yeah. and, um, and it was when I was living in, in Germany. So I had, um, yeah, like a German ID card, but that didn't help. And there was this particular kind of extra insurance you had to have on your car to get into Bosnia. Yes. Yes, the uh, like a green or a yellow or something. Yeah. I can't the remember. card. It's green. It's green. Yeah. <laughs> it's green, and it's not cheap. No, and it's and it was. I didn't really understand it, and you know, it was like whatever, ten, eleven years ago. There wasn't, you know, I didn't have a smartphone to check, and and then I at one st- I think we tried three times. The first time it was just no one around, border totally closed. The second time, people around, but you couldn't get the insurance at that time. Third time, we finally got in. But um, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah that that part of the world does make it hard, I reckon. So their detour was a really elaborate way to miss a traffic jam, but they got there in the end. Uh, now my next guest is Ian from the Barefoot Backpacker, and he had a well, also a kind of a detour when he was crossing some borders in Africa. I am particularly bad at crossing borders. There's there's two that spring to mind, um, mm-hmm. both in West Africa. Right. Um, the first one was going from Ghana to Burkina Faso. Mm-hmm. Um, really hot day. Uh, when would it be? Would it been end of November a couple of years back? Okay. Uh, um, crossed. A, I was in a small, obscure border town, like one of those really small villages where there's like one hotel and seven people. <laughs> and, and a border. And, and a border. And it all went perfectly logical. I was I, I, I was I, I was staying in an overnight hotel. Well, I say hotel. It was a glorified horse stable thing. <laughs> I was the only person in there. It was about five pound a night, and it was probably overpriced. But um, it, it was an awesome place. It had a cockroach the size of my middle finger in the oh, toilet. It was great. Cockroaches are uh, one of my least favourite things. Ugh. <laughs> Well, I would have taken a picture of it, but I didn't want to spend long in, too long in the toilet than I needed to. So <laughs> don't I blame you. Oh, um, it wasn't an ensuite toilet, though, so don't worry. It was, it was nowhere near my room. Oh, um, Unfortunate. <laughs> so I'm there in this village, and I don't know where the border is. I, I know the border is, is very close, because that's uh-huh. the whole point of the village. Um, so I asked a couple of the locals, where's the border? They said, just carry on down this road and you get to Burkina Faso. So I did. And it was a very busy road. It was a, well, I say road, it was a small, quite a wide trail. I mean, it's a small road, but a wide trail. Uh-huh. Um, one of those, you know, dusty, stony gravel paths, um, sort of scribbling either side. So I walk and get, keep getting passed by these moto taxis and um people going from one side to the other and carry on walking and carry on walking <laughs> and eventually reach the main road where there's lots of 
stalls like you'd find in a marketplace by a border. And I thought, OK, I must go to the border. So I carry on walking. Bearing in mind that it's about two o'clock in the afternoon, it's about 35 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After about seven kilometres, oh, goodness. I reached a small village with a border post. Except that it's not a border post. It's a police station. Oh. And all the signs are in French. So I'm going, what? So I walk in and go, where's the border? In very bad French. And he says, it's about seven kilometres down the road that way. I've just come from that direction. Oh, no. Turns out what I'd done is I'd crossed the border accidentally by following all the labels. <laughs> so I was, now, I was now in Burkina Faso illegally. Oh, no. Completely accidentally. <laughs> it's hardly your fault. What did you do? Well, I did the only thing I could do in the circumstance, which is walk back. No way. Now, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately um, I managed to get a lift from a, a, on the back of a moto taxi most of the way. Oh, good. Um, so I didn't have to walk in the, in the heat again. Mm. So I got off the moto taxi about, I don't know, maybe 200 metres from the border and tried to find my way back across the border, which was more difficult this time because I knew I was doing something illegal. <laughs> yes, I'd be terrified by now. <laughs> When I crossed the first time, it was kind of accidental. Oh, my God, what's going on? Oh, right. well, that's quite interesting. Crossing back into Ghana was kind of like, well, what happens if I get caught? What do mm. I tell people? But um, fortunately, because this is a route that lots of people take, there's, uh, the border seems to be optional for locals, um, I managed to find the path I'd taken. I got a little bit of help from one of the locals who was crossing over. Um, managed to find the path and ended up back in the in the village of Hamile in Ghana. And I thought, OK, that's not the best thing to do, is it? And then managed to find, eventually I managed to find the correct border. Uh, and it's legally. Phew. You know, the, thing, the thing about it that made it even more worse in my mind was the fact that they'd only just reopened that border um, because about three weeks earlier there'd been a, a revolution in Burkina Faso and they closed all the borders. So, <laughs> and so, they obviously weren't so concerned by this stage three weeks later yeah, about people crossing the borders. Wow. So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's my first little um, how not to cross a border in Africa story. <laughs> I'll, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> uh, What's the second one? Well, all right, right. Well, this is going from um, Benin to Togo about two, two and a half weeks later. Hmm. Um, and this was a fairly principle. This was a fairly simple border. <laughs> I, there's a small village in Benin on the south coast called Grand Popo. It's a, um, a couple of miles from the border. So I got a share taxi. And in Africa, you've, that's one of the main forms of transport, it's the share mm. taxi. So you've got these sort of cars, people drive them. And then it's sort of like a cross between a bus and a taxi. So you, you hail them, and you get in, and then someone else gets in, and you share the cost of the taxi because you're all going to more or less the same place. Mm -hmm. So easy, maybe. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I, I get this share taxi from Grand Popo um, with someone else who's going into Togo. Now, this is one of those problems where foreigners and locals, again, have different ways of crossing the border. <laughs> I was dropped off from the share taxi at the border post. Um, the other person in the share taxi stayed in it and they sort of did their admin and drove on somewhere. I obviously had to get out and get stamped out of Benin and then stamped into Togo. Right. This didn't take that long. It took maybe about 10 minutes or so. Um, trouble is, when I left the Togo border post and entered the country, my <laughs> share taxi was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> It had completely vanished, along with the other person in it and my baggage. Oh, no. Oh, so dear. This does become a problem. Well, yes. So the only thing I had on me were my passport and some money. Oh, goodness. So I had I, I was barefoot as well. So <laughs> everything was in that bag. Shoes, clothes, um Toothbrush. Like, yes, toothbrush, um, tablet, phone, 
Everything was in my bag. Oh, no. So I'm there, waiting at the border, probably looking very, very strange. <laughs> As You know, tall, hairy, pasty white, fat, white man. Um, with no shoes. With no shoes. Looking completely out of place. Going, oh, my God, what are we now? So I, I sort of hung around a bit. Nothing happened. Taxi didn't turn up. <laughs> Wandered up the hill to where the um, effectively the car park was, where you can obviously get a loads of share taxis back in, and couldn't find the taxi there. Had a word with a couple of the people who said, who wondered if they'd seen it around. <laughs> Apparently not. Um, have you paid it? No, I haven't paid him. Oh, he'll be back then. <laughs> ah. Um. Slightly positive. So like, absolutely. Like, that's not the first time that's happened either. Loitered <laughs> around um, the taxi rank for about 20, 25 minutes. Wandered back to the board post to see him. He was back to the board post. No dice. Oh, no. Uh, eventually, one of them came running up to me and said, right, we've seen him. He's on his way back. <laughs> Phew. I hope this is true. So it was. Fortunately, it was. So I, I then run, <sighs> run back up the hill to the taxi rank and we meet up and I go, Woo, what happened? And he said, basically, you were taking too long to cross the border, so I thought I'd um, take the other passenger, drop them off and come back for you. <laughs> Which is wonderful, except that you exactly. had no idea about this. It's perfectly efficient and exactly what I would have done, but it was nice to have been told. Well, as is so often the case, all's well that ends well, and these things turn into a great travel story. So um, I'm glad that Ian turned out uh, not to have uh, been caught at being across the border illegally uh, and that he caught up with his belongings. So I guess this is the kind of thing that the kind of stuff that goes on in West Africa, which is a, a very intriguing and elusive place to me. I would love to explore it sometime. Anyway, my final guest today is Matt Eakin, and he had a very interesting border crossing entering Bangladesh. And I should preface this by saying we don't recommend doing what he did, but it's made a great story. I never had sort of thought that I'd really go to Bangladesh, but I then literally, this was in the morning, I, I then booked a ticket and then literally at four o'clock in the afternoon, I was on a plane Fabulous. to Bangladesh, right. to Dhaka, and I'd only the only thing I knew about Bangladesh was obviously um, that the, the standard of living wasn't very high. Um, it was a developing country, and that the capital city was Dhaka. That, and that's, that's it. Of my knowledge of Bangladesh, <laughs> that's about what I know. So, <laughs> so yeah, you you can understand that you're you're now in the same position that I was, and uh, and except I was, you were on a plane a, heading there, <laughs> and yeah, and I was on a plane heading there, and and the only difference, and also that, so when I got on this plane. Um, there was a there was a festival, and I didn't know this, but it, there was a festival called Estima, and there's this festival in um, Bangladesh, or in Dhaka, in the capital called Estima. That um, it's a Muslim festival, and millions of people go. Millions of people go. Oops. <laughs> it's something like two to three million people go, um, and some years four million people go to this festival. Wow! Um, it was an amazing festival um, about. Um, how yeah people yeah people get all to get together in this very tiny area and um and then worship for a week and i didn't know anything about this i didn't know it was on and i get on this plane and um the only person that um that wasn't going to estima <laughs> <laughs> and the only other people on this plane were these two americans and um i've, I've just forgotten the name danny uh, and, and husband um and they came up to me and said, oh, hi, uh, what are you doing on this plane? And I said, <laughs> oh. well, um, hi, I'm coming to be a tourist in Bangladesh. And they said to me, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> because we've been in Bangladesh for five years and there's no tourists. <laughs> oh, no way. Wow. And I said, what do you mean by no tourists? And they said, Nobody comes to Bangladesh as a tourist. And I thought, oh, when people say no tourists, they just mean, well, not, not many. many. Hmm. Yeah. Surely. And they said, no, no tourists. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We've never met any tourists in Bangladesh. <laughs> and I said, oh, wow, this is, this is, an, this is, this is starting to rethink my decision now. <laughs> 
maybe maybe Matt might end up with uh, yeah <laughs> having some bad experiences. And um, they said to me, "You're staying with us." Oh. And I said, "Oh, okay." They said, "Nobody comes to Bangladesh as a tourist. Um, you're going to stay with us." And I said, oh, "Okay." Um, so I, so we're on this plane. We're sitting in different seats. We're chatting a little bit on the plane. We then arrive in Dhaka and um, and. Now I've got to Dhaka, I've got no visa. I, I, I'm hoping that the worst case scenario would be that I'll just get sent back on a plane back to maybe Australia or where I came from, back to Cambodia, um, and then if I, if I can't get in. And, and I line up at the, at the desk and everyone's getting through and, uh, and then they get to me and I, I, just, I just hand over my passport. I don't know what to do. I can't speak Bengali. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hoping you can speak English. And I say to him, oh, Hi, <laughs> can, can, I, can I come into your country? <laughs> and the and the desk person looks at me and he's just like, um, uh, looks at my passport. And he sees that I'm Australian, um, and he goes, no, n- like waves me away, he's like no, no visa, no, no entry, no, 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 no entry, no entry. And I was like, well, oh, no, can, no. can you can you help me out? <laughs> And then he just dismissed me. So I sort of had to walk away and I'm sort of sitting in the customs area going, well, um, in the immigration area sitting there going, well, what do I do? So I then go over to this other official looking person and I said to him, um, and I don't really advise people do this. I, this is not a, 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 a podcast <laughs> advising people how to travel. No. <laughs> but um, at my wise age, I, I did this anyway. I went over to this guy and said, oh, I got told by – another person and pointed back to the front desk somewhere that I could get a visa from you. And then I said, Oh, I told he said to me, I could pay you 40 American dollars. And the guy, the guy was obviously first looked at me and said like, no, like he, he couldn't really speak English very well and was also dismissing me saying, no, that that's not going to happen. Um, and then I said, Oh, well I got told I could pay you 40 American dollars. And then he said, Oh, well, maybe we can work something out. No way. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, – and I took out the money and then he saw the money and then he said – and then he, I could clearly see him thinking, well, okay, with 40 American dollars, something might be out of work. And then I, I, I gave him my passport and I just made sure that I looked at it the whole time that he didn't move it somewhere or hide it and mm. then try to do something. And then – so I watched him the whole time and he put a, this weird stamp on there and – this um this like sticker and wrote a note on it and I was just like oh, okay and I was just the whole time I was worried about my passport and he closed it I was like okay well I'll try this and hopefully it doesn't say <laughs> as my stepdad said to me hope it doesn't say uh, lock this guy up <laughs> yeah exactly because <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows <laughs> and yeah who knows what what it means and then so I went back to the desk and to another another person at one of these immigration desks and then lined up again and and um handed over my passport and then he looked at me really weird and I was like, oh, gosh, it, it's, yeah, it's happened. He's written something in there like I'm going to go to jail. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I'm going. And then you're having all these immediate thoughts like, okay, what happens if you're in jail in Bangladesh? Does the consulate come and get you? How do you get out? I mean, how much money do I have? <laughs> Is it a good idea to start bribing officials? Like what do I do? And then he's like treated me like trying to usher me through and, so, oh yeah, it's going to happen. Maybe I should just like, what do I do? I just run back into the airport. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> and and then um, and then he's walking me through. And then then I meet these Americans who have been waiting for me the whole time. And then um, we're getting and then they they get pulled along with us. And he's treating me with like now by this stage he's treating me with like almost this reverence, like I'm somebody Ooh. special. Um, we're getting cleared, and all these security guards get stepped aside, and we're walking through these doors and getting clearances and getting pushed through the airport, and then getting out the front, and someone's grabbing my bag. Then I was like, oh gosh, I don't, okay, maybe this does seem like a good thing, but it feels like it doesn't feel very good. And then um, and then I get to the exit of the airport, and he bows and oh. and um, he says all these different Bangladi, Bangladi, Bangladi. The G words, and um, and then the American people are going, "Guy, who are you? Like, <laughs> we we just thought you were a tourist. <laughs> I am. Must, be, must be someone like someone really important." <laughs> and then um, I, I said, "I was sitting there, still a bit dumbfounded, going, I don't know what's going on." And then um, and then I opened my passport, and then it says on my passport, 
diplomat. <laughs> So I entered the country on a few weeks of a diplomatic visa, and then and then um, I was like, oh wow, okay. And then when we got to outside, and these because he told her these other, obviously said something to these other people, and we got this knows a taxi before person. anybody. Yeah, we, 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 there were all these other people had to wait, and we got a taxi before other people got a taxi because it was Esther was on, and there's all these people everywhere, and it's going crazy, and we, nobody can get cars, and, and so we ended up, and then we got this taxi, and then. Um, and it wasn't until, sorry, a bit later that I checked my passport and then they were like, oh, wow, and we got this taxi and before we had to wait for anybody else. And, then, and that's when they were sort of thinking, who, who am I? And then I looked at my passport and told them in the taxi that, oh, well, I'm actually a diplomat. <laughs> and, and they were like, oh. <laughs> and, and then I told them the story in full that how I hadn't got a visa and they didn't know what I was doing and I hadn't got in, you know. And then they were just like, you really are quite crazy. Well, each time I've re-listened to Matt's story, I have laughed just as loudly because I, I love that he suddenly became a diplomat. So there you go, diplomatic status for um, 40 American dollars, pretty cheap. Um, so yeah, don't try this at home, as they say. So that's it for uh, all these amazing border crossing stories. Have you had a crazy or curious or bizarre experience crossing a border? Do tell. Come over to our Facebook group. Just search for Thoughtful Travellers on Facebook or hit the link in the show notes and tell me all about your curious border crossings. I'm waiting to hear them. Um, as always, big shout out to our three, well, in fact, four guests today. So I had Elizabeth and Jeff from Dutch Dutch Goose. I then had Ian from the Barefoot Backpacker and in the show notes, I'm going to leave a link to a particular section of his blog, which is all about crossing the border. Some great stories in there. And finally, I had Matt Eakin from Himalayan Schoolies. And um, I'm sure that he's not recommending this uh, Bangladesh style action to the schoolies who he sends on these amazing trips. Um, so uh, do join us on Facebook at Thoughtful Travellers or catch up with me on Twitter at Amanda Kendall and use the hashtag Thoughtful Travel Pod. All of these links and more will be on the show notes at notaballerina.com slash 78. Thank you very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.